across more and more contradictions in the situation there, and much of it seemed to hinge on what was going on in Eritrea, which was not widely reported because no journalists were allowed. I got permission to go into the, uh, the feeding centers, for, this was of course post-1973-74 panel, Yes. Some of you are old enough to. Well, yeah. uh, and and I, I got up into uh, Wolo and then just kept going. Got out on the uh, uh, on the highway. Uh, got out on the highway. And I met a couple of Eritreans who were traveling north. Uh, they said, "Look, if you're really interested in finding out what's going on there, we can get you in." They got me to Makale, got me permission to travel on on a convoy, uh, and my friend and I uh, entered from Adoa in a huge convoy uh, that was in April of 1976. Second day we were there, the colonel who had led the convoy in was assassinated. The whole city was shot up by Ethiopian forces, uh, more than 30 people, or I believe, I don't actually know them. Like a large number of people were taken out of their houses and executed. Their bodies were left out on street corners. And I, shocked by what I saw, and shocked by the fact that this was going on and nobody was talking about it outside, set out to write about it. Uh, and uh, I did. I went from there to Sudan, uh, met both the EPLF and the ELF, and then traveled inside for uh, five and a half weeks, uh, half with each uh, front. Got into Sahel, and uh, one day I was taking a walk down a dry riverbed and was taken to a, a clump of trees, and inside was this wood shop where the, some of the young boys were putting together uh, furniture and boxes and other things from leftover wood uh, in crates that had brought food and other things, goods, into the field. Uh, in a, another spot, I was in a cave where they were making leather goods. Uh, this was a, a sewing machine they told me it had been nationalized. Uh, it had been taken from an Italian shop in Asmara. And, uh, and they were making goods for the front uh, in underground uh, uh, workshops. They were repairing weapons. This was a, a complex operation, much of it. Uh, underground or in caves to protect people from the daily, almost daily, uh, raids by the Ethiopian aircraft, the American aircraft, being flown by Ethiopian pilots, of course. Um, I traveled up into the highlands. This was the village of Zagar, where I spent a lot of time over the years. Uh, the village administration was being reorganized. The village committee had been set up. It's 1976. Uh, it's all men at this time. Uh, when I went back in 77, it was uh, men, women, and young people uh, coming out of a complex structure of associations that had been organized there. So there, the, the, behind the front lines, there was an effort to really uh, organize uh, and manage the society. Both the ELF and the EPLF were doing it. Uh, I, uh, I came back again uh, in the summer of 1977, and spent six months that time all uh, inside ETLF areas. Uh, this is a training camp for women. Uh, men and women were trained separately and then integrated into common units uh, once they got out. Military training at that time went on for as long as six months, which was a reflection of the, the, the depth of uh, discipline being uh, in developed uh, and, and internal organization uh, among the, the new recruits. Uh, of course, that's very different from the way it, uh, it is today. This was also a highly politicized uh, movement. Both, both fronts were, uh, the EPLF uh, in particular, these guys, uh, every military unit and, and non-military department uh, was having political study sessions three times a week. The book that they're reading from there, sitting uh, there on the ground, was produced uh, in, in Sahel. 
uh, by the EPS Political Department, which I think we all know now was actually being run by the Eritrean People's Revolutionary Party, the secret party that ran the EPLF. Uh, and this book really was, this was the little orange book of Eritrea, uh, was the, the, the ideological uh, core of what the EPLF uh, was using to try to remold uh, its members. Uh, in a, a fairly uniform uh, organization. I believe this was the first women's demonstration uh, in Eritrea, uh, although it could turn out there was there were demonstrations earlier in the 50s during, and 60s during the student uh, upheavals. But this was taking place in 1977, really organized around women's participation in the struggle because Many women were meeting resistance from families <coughs> uh, for even attending women's organization meetings. This is in Karen. Front was also uh, very involved in uh, education uh, with uh, schools running around uh, in uh, most of the liberated zones uh, and a public health system that was already in 1977. Uh, fairly sophisticated with different layers going from uh, barefoot doctors who traveled around in small units uh, to uh, frontline clinics, intermediate clinics, and then the hospital back in, in the Fox area. So, have we organized the party? Have we politicized the, uh, it's a have we organized front? Uh, have we politicized, run by uh, Party that uh, all the shots uh, set up the, um, the program for the EPLF before its congresses, uh, decided on the slate of who would be elected in those same congresses, and, and also managed many of the day to day operations of the front. So when we saw this extraordinarily disciplined organization from the outside, what we were seeing was an inner organization acting through. Uh, oh, oh, wider shell. Throughout 1977, the EPLF and the ELF took more and more uh, territory with most of the towns uh, and small to medium sized cities falling to them. Of course, the um, turning point came at the end of the year in the south. And I was uh, outside uh, Masawa in the first battles and then came into the city uh, and was right there when they uh, went over the top of the, uh, the, the barrier there and charged across the salt flats, uh, trying to capture the, the uh, naval base out there on the peninsula. There was another attempt uh, simultaneous to this to cross the causeway and capture the two islands uh, where uh, many of the shipping offices and, and the Ethiopian forces were at that time. Both attempts failed. And this was really the first time that the EPLF faced a, a major setback on the ground. Hundreds of people were killed. Uh, and the, uh, what was behind a lot of this was that this was the time of transition where the old American-backed army uh, had begun to fade, uh, and was in many respects beginning to fall apart. Uh, and the new Soviet-backed, uh, equipped, advised uh, army was making its appearance. There were also a lot of new weapons in this. Uh, we were being bombarded by, from the air uh, by a lot of fire bombs, and I don't know whether they were napalm or something else. Um, we use napalm sometimes for any fire bomb, but it could have been phosphorus, it could have been something, but the city was really, many of the, the residential areas were on fire. Uh, it was a very difficult time. So, 1978, big turn. The Soviet Union comes in, picks up uh, Ethiopia under Mengistu, and in effect, the fronts fight a second liberation war, having almost won the first one uh, in 1977. I, I, I don't need to go through all the details, but of course, there were the series of retreats until uh, the, the lines were drawn around Nakba and broadly the Sahel base area, uh, the mountains themselves became uh, fortresses. These, the next couple of photographs are really from the early 90s. Um, 
just going back to look at that train system. If you've been out to Nakba, you would have seen this. Um, these went on for miles, these trenches, and they were